class. Welcome to Advantage. I'm Dr. Jody Richardson Delgado, and we're going to be going over the history of psychology today. This is part of a video series that will cover introduction to psychology. So first we need to talk about the meaning of psychology. And psychology in Latin means the study of the soul. So from the beginning, we were really interested in what was going on inside of us. Now, the definition of psychology that you will read in many textbooks is the scientific study of behavior and mental process. And so when we talk about this and when we really dissect this meaning of psychology and we look at the scientific study, we're talking about today more of the scientific process. So going through that scientific method. Now, much of what we'll talk about that's early in our history of psychology doesn't necessarily follow the scientific method and the science rigor that we have today. But much of what we have in our history really covers and goes over a collection of facts, a collection of observations that many psychologists have used to form a theory. Now, when we look at behavior, we're talking about outward expressions and sometimes we're aware of what's influencing our behavior and other times we're not. So behavior can be body expressions, it can be facial expressions, it can be the way in which we do things, certain habits that we have. And then when we're talking about mental process, we're talking about things like memory, decision making, problem solving. So we put all of this together in the field of psychology. Really, psychology gets its roots early on because you see the definition in Latin is, or the definition of psychology in Latin, is really the study of the soul. And this is something that Plato and Aristotle were really interested in. Who are we? What's going on inside of us? And Plato really talked about how truth and knowledge comes in the soul. It's part of us. Aristotle talks about how knowledge is the result of experiences. Our first psychologist to really establish the field was Wilhelm Wundt. He is the father of psychology. He's the father of psychology because he wrote the first textbook. And he really was interested in looking at inner experiences and self-observations what happens in our internal world as well as our external world. He often had people sit and reflect about their experiences of maybe looking at a sunset or eating a certain dish and really talking about what that was. In his laboratory, he really observed people when they were in different situations. His student, Titchener, was the one who really branded this as structuralism and he helped Wundt establish the first laboratory in psychology. Now, structuralism isn't something that we use today in psychology, but it really formed the foundation for some of the research that we see. William James uh, was a psychologist who really came after or just on the tails of Titchener and Wundt, and he looked at the field of functionalism, and that was his area of psychology. And he was interested in the stream of consciousness, these thoughts that are constantly going on inside of our mind. Some of these thoughts are related to one another, and sometimes they seem very random. And so he would have people record their thoughts and their stream of consciousness. And he found that our consciousness was constantly evolving. He also looked at how we function in our environment and how our conscious helps us function in our environment. Then we have Freud. Freud is probably one of the most well-known historical psychologists in our field. He is the father of psychodynamic, psychoanalytic perspective. He wrote many, many things in many areas, which is why he is so well known. He talked about how we develop as children into adulthood. He talked about the unconscious conflict that we constantly have. He talked about the unconscious process of making decisions, of how this unconscious process is what is really guiding our behavior day in and day out. So Freud felt, and you see this picture of the iceberg in front of you, and you see this, this head that's in the iceberg, and what's above the water, according to Freud, is really what we are aware of right now. This is our conscious awareness. So the things that we see around us, the things that we're hearing, that's all part of our conscious. 
the, the unconscious is really what's below the surface. So things that we can bring to recall very quickly are things that maybe your phone number from when you were a child or your address or your teacher from second grade. But then there's this whole world that's underneath that of memories and experiences and thoughts that came before that or things that we have suppressed. And according to Freud, that is really what is guiding our behavior day in and day out. So do you know someone, because I'm sure it's not you, that dates the same losers over and over? It's the same type of person and they constantly are talking about how they're always attracting these bad people to them or they're getting in these relationships that seem to repeat themselves. Well, according to Freud, that would be that would be a pattern that maybe we have deep within our unconscious that needs to be brought to the surface to really discuss. Now, later in our class, we're gonna talk more in depth about Freud and really get into some of the techniques that he used to help bring some of those unconscious conflicts to the surface. Next, we have the behavioral perspective. Now, the behaviorists weren't, weren't just a reaction to Freud. They didn't come about just because of Freud's ideas, but they certainly had a strong reaction to Freud because at this time in history, this is the rise of science. And this is the time when everything must be observable, everything must be tangible. And if I can't see it, then it, it's really not science. So part of their reaction to Freud was, how do you measure the unconscious? And I'll tell you, as a side note, this is one of the things that I love about the field of psychology. We have these amazing ideas and these amazing theories that come, and there's other people that will argue against them. And it's through the, the battles that people have through their research that we really get an expanded knowledge of the human experience. And that's what I truly love about this field. So the behaviorists come along and they're saying, no, it must be observable. We must be able to do this in a laboratory. And it was Pavlov, Watson, and Skinner who were the key figures of behaviorism. There were many other scientists at this time who were looking at behaviorism. But it was actually Pavlov and Watson who did most of their work in classical conditioning. And then we had Skinner. While he didn't found operant conditioning by itself, he certainly did a lot of work with operant conditioning. Now when we look at classical conditioning, we see that Pavlov was the one who really found this. And he did this by doing experiments with dogs and he was collecting their saliva to really understand the digestive system. He was a biologist by training, but he noticed that these dogs were responding before he would actually give them food or food powder in his experiment. And he wanted to look further at why these dogs were salivating before the food was even presented to them. And so he did an entire experiment to see what might trigger this response of salivation. And he was able to get these dogs to salivate to tuning forks and other things in the environment. And that's where he found that the environment really does impact our behavior. We're gonna talk more about operant and classical conditioning in a future video. Operant conditioning is really about our behavior and the environment and how we respond to rewards and punishments. Skinner did a lot of work in how these rewards and punishments change our behavior. So a reward, when we get rewarded for something, we're more likely to repeat that behavior again. When we're punished for something, we're less likely to repeat that behavior again. So some of the key things about behaviorism and this school of thought is that really the environment is what is so important to how we behave in the world around us. Now, of course, there were people that disagreed with this and we come into humanistic psychology. Some of the key figures are Rogers and Maslow. There were several others, but we're really in this class going to focus on these two theorists and kind of what they brought to us. And again, we're going to talk more in depth about humanistic psychology in later videos. But just to give us an idea, the humanistic perspective, as you know or may know from Abraham Maslow, really talks about this hierarchy of needs. This idea that we are growth-seeking individuals and our human nature is really to grow into the best version of who we are. But according to Abraham Maslow, we really start at a basic need that we need to 
have fulfilled before we can move up into our highest potential. And he really talked about how we need to fulfill some of these needs of food and shelter and safety and belonging before we can really grow and learn to be who we really can be. Now, Carl Rogers was another key figure in psychology, and he really gave us this idea of un unconditional positive regard, being who you are with another person without having conditions. So if there's ever times that you feel like that you need to act a certain way in order to get approval from another individual, Carl Rogers talks about sometimes that blocks our potential, that blocks the way that we can reach our goal, whatever that is. So a lot of the humanistic perspective really talks about our goal-seeking behavior and what what gets in the way of us really reaching our goals? And that's a lot of what the humanistic perspective works on. Now today, the cognitive perspective is really important to us because this is where we're really studying things like memory and problem solving and how we can remember things when we want to. Or maybe you've had the experience where you've really wanted to remember something like on your test and suddenly you can't remember it. And it's our cognitive psychologists that really look at the process of memory and problem solving. And they often use a computer to help them understand how this input and storage happens within our body and within our brain. Another perspective that is current and we are seeing a huge rise of right now is biopsychology. You'll also hear neuropsychology. There's many names for this, but this is really about how the brain works, how hormones and neurochemicals affect our behavior and mental process. And you may have experienced times when you have gotten maybe a little irritable or a little angry when you're hungry. It's known as hangry. So biopsychologists research and look at these areas of psychology and what's affecting our emotions and behavior and thinking. So these are some questions that we need to consider. How does heredity and the environment affect intelligence and personality? What makes humans similar because of our common biology and different because of our differing environments? How is gender influenced by biological differences and social influences? Do we inherit mental health issues or is this an upbringing and environmental explanation? These are the kinds of questions that we consider in psychology. And you can see at the root of these questions is that debate, is it nature or is it nurture? And this is a, big, a debate that continues today in our field. And we're gonna talk about this throughout our class. Today we covered the definition of psychology, the early history of psychology, including early philosophers, structuralism, functionalism, and psychoanalysis. Then we discussed the more recent areas of psychology, such as behaviorism, humanistic psychology, cognitive, and biopsychology. I look forward to working with you more in this class.